So in the next session, um, we're going to pick up on things that were mentioned actually quite a bit uh, in the morning. You know, we learned, we heard a lot about uh, the transformation happening also in the supply chain uh, across different different types of suppliers, from traditional um, metal-based, to say, you know, piston uh, producers, and and all that's needed to sort of shift into this new era that we're now working with. And you know, lots of debate around the pace. Uh, a lot of debate around uh, where support should come. Um, but in, th in this session, we're really going to look inside the operations uh, of, of, of one major tier one supplier, and, but uh, very applicable uh, across, uh, across many others, uh, and, and along with an uh, so equipment supplier who can, who can support that. And I think give you some real, hopefully some real insights into, into, into how, that's, how that's happening, what it means from uh, points of view of, of digitalization, from from skills and, 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 and training and culture within a companies, as well as the technology and processes itself. So uh, it, it, again, we're going to have a panel format, so some similar to, to what we, we did in the morning. And with that, I'm going to uh, start to bring up our, our panel. Uh, our first expert has uh, more than 25 years of experience uh, in, in the, mainly in the tier, tier supply, supply chain, um, working for, for a number of years uh, across a number of other automotive suppliers. Uh, since 2019, he's been helping to lead the electrified powertrain division uh, for ZF, uh, and I believe that's responsibility across some, some 25 plants uh, across, across the world, and we'll talk a bit more about it. Um, we've been pleased to welcome him previously on some of our virtual events and broadcasts and interviews, uh, and I'm glad he can finally be with us here in person. Arno Gullering, Senior Vice President, Operations, uh, Division Powertrain, Electrified Powertrain at ZF. So Arno, please join us. Thank you. So, also joining on the panel uh, is, is a senior leader uh, of Hardinger, uh, which over the past two years has, has really experienced quite a bit of, of, of growth, and, and, and he, he's played a key role in this, including leading on a number of M&A &A, uh, projects. Um, that's included uh, acquisition of Ohio Tool Works in the U.S. and J.G. Weiser uh, uh, here in Germany. Uh, 35 years experience in the sector, and very pleased that Stephen Nunn uh, from Hardinger could join us on the panel as well. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks again. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get into it. We talked quite a bit this morning about, of course, uh, the uncertainty, the VUCA conditions that the, the industry is, is facing. And I'd like to turn that now more specifically into the, into the supply chain, the tier one supply chain, tier two supply chain, and kind of understand how its uh, manufacturing uh, is adapting. And, and Arno, I'd like to, to start with you on that one. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, Chris, <clears throat> yeah, times have getting, um, gotten really um, volatile these days. Um, I mean, we had the Corona crisis and then we had um, the automotive crisis and now we are going through the semiconductor crisis uh, and that all together is uh, shifting the supply chain to more electronics and e-mobility parts. What we do is um, we turned um, away really from looking into the back. We do high forecast, um, high, high frequency forecasting. Um, we forecast the next three months um, once a week yeah, with all our plans and um, have a very close connection to our suppliers and also to our OEMs. We um, double check and triple check the EDIs which are in the system and discuss them. And um, that has led us to much more precision. Um, in forecasting what what's happening yeah for because I mean if you're if you have such a number of, of workforce uh, people which need to be steered as far as attendance and those things and also uh, suppliers which do deliver or sometimes do not deliver <laughs> in, <laughs> in case of the semiconductors. <laughs> oh no no more the material suppliers uh, that needs to be um, steered and, and you have to take a wise risk every once in a while and, and we have air freights also because of, of this yeah. and um, but all in all looking back in the year we managed we managed it quite well um, and uh, looking into Q1 we see it not so dark as, as it is uh, right now in, in the newspapers um, I think we have a good steering algorithm and steering mechanism in place. Yeah. 
some good news for once to share. Uh, Q1 is not as dark as anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Stephen, in the companies that Orange and your many companies are working with, how, how, has, how has this era of volatility and, and, and uncertainty changed the way you're working with your, your customers and, and also in your business? Well, it's, um, it's, it's challenging for sure, and, and mainly because of the, all the challenges that the Tier 1 um, suppliers have fall, a lot of that fall on our shoulders as well. Now, just to put it in perspective, um, you know, who, who Hardinge is, um, it's an American company with European technologies, and we've been, over the last hundred years, acquiring European technologies um, uh, that focus on various industries. The auto industry for us is, um, is one of the largest, of, of course. Um, but we've transformed our business over the last um, 20, 20 years or so from being just a standard machine tool provider to a total solution provider where we're now doing 90% um, uh, of our business is a uh, turnkey job. So, so as, as the industry, especially um, the, the tier one suppliers, who's one of our largest customers, have depended on, on, on us for solutions. We're very, very application specific um, to, to what we do. So, uh, you know, a company like, like ZF is going to um, depend on, on us for very rapid turnaround. You know, it was interesting. I was in one of the ZF plants just a, just a few months ago and didn't even realize just how rapidly, say, over the last five years, the life expectancy of your new products ha has changed, you know. And so, if you take a transmission that that uh, when it was developed, you know, and whether it was for GM or for Ford or, or for or for uh, whichever OEM, you know, and they they even predicted that they would you know be giving you guys orders for um, you know for seven years, and now all of a sudden the life expectancy of that is is on average around Life. two and a half. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and especially with the EV uh, structure now, you know. So so again, it's uh, um, the 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 challenges they face um, get get shoved on our shoulders very very quickly. <laughs> mm, yeah, I can I can I can imagine that. Um, on that, or maybe just jumping on that on that point already. Um, oh no, because uh, here, here we hear shortening shortening life cycles, managing uh, a disrupted supply chain. Okay, you've changed your forecast and communication to help help manage that. But in parallel, as I said in in the in the beginning, you're responsible for, you know, the transformation, the operations of the electrified powertrain. Um, so, what are some of the keys to doing doing that in, in parallel to to shifting your operations and balancing with this disruption and re at the same time as a reduced uh, uh, life cycle times, let's say, give us a, <laughs> give us a sense. I mean, the main, main thing is yet that you shift the product, just as Steve said, said, yeah. Um, we, we have, I mean, ZF is one of the few who is virtually invested, um, from the electronics over the components for the gearing, which you need, yeah? I mean, you need gearing also to the electric motor housing, everything we do ourselves. And there's a lot of new stuff included yeah, for um, electronics, uh, for the, the inverter. Um, that is a learning also of the course of the last couple of years. An inverter is just is not just an electronic part. It's very special components needed for that. Yeah, MOSFET uh, power um, parts, power components. And uh, with this, a lot of new suppliers come into play. Yeah, a lot of people you do not know, a lot of companies you do not know, a lot of companies who do not um, have a mature process because it's new for them also. And a lot of players stepped into this area um, of, of producing these components for, for inverters. And uh, they, they, are, they are every once in a while difficult to manage yeah, because they do not deliver what they should. And they do not deliver the quality which is agreed and, and we are in between the OEMs which at the same point have um, a super ambitious target of selling these EVs. You know that if they do not reach their fleet targets, they get penalized yeah. Yeah. and every lost um, EV in our days means money for them, penalized money. And uh, that is quite um, quite a task to manage that out. Mm. 
And at, at Harden, you, you mentioned you've been buying European technology for 100 years, so it's not new, I suppose, that, that you've been doing that clearly. But, um, you know, how, how has your kind of, let's call it, acquisition strategy been shifting and changing, partly as we, as we just heard, because we hear these new players coming onto the market, new requirements. Has is that, is that changed the way you've, you've, you've approached that? Yeah, yeah, it has. Um, it, you know, and again, we, we shift basically with our acquisition strategy as the industries we serve change. And, and you know, one, one of the reasons why um, we, we just acquired the, the J.G. Weiser company mm. was because of the, the um, technology that had been developed over the last five years for the EV market. Um, we've been working on certain applications, let's say, with some of our other brands, but uh, Weiser brought to us a lot of, of application-specific EV projects that we were not, uh, we were not let's say, having access to with our other brands, both European as well as American. Mm. And, 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 and I'll know just in that, in that shift and change is, is we, we talked about this this morning in a few sessions, are uh, changes in the footprint of your supply chain uh, becoming a key priority, reshoring, nearshoring, whether in Europe or North America um, for your respective plants? Um, of course, very much. Yeah. Reason, reason for this is, um, I mean, you see now where the EV market picks up. I mean, everybody knows China is going like crazy, yeah, two to EVs. We see uh, a big catch up in the US, yeah, with all the subsidies and the change plans and those things. And uh, obviously, we need the supply base in these areas. We build up um, as we speak five new plants worldwide, two in China mm -hmm. uh, and three in Mexico mm -hmm. to support this growth in these regions. Um, obviously, capacity-wise, as far as the number of plants you mentioned, the 26 earlier, um, in Europe, um, there, there is sufficient capacity. There, there we look at, into shifting these component and assembly plants to the new products. That's quite successful these days mm -hmm. yeah because um, it's a lot of assembly um, is, is is connected to that yeah and we have uh, this system um, system experienced plants just like the Brücken as uh, Steve mentioned but the supply base let's say for US and and for China that is something which we need to look into and uh, which is probably not always there right now yeah, to the extent where we would need it. Yeah, that's one of the major tasks for the next two years also to look into that more deeply. Well, from Hardings, because I mean, also obviously there's how you serve your customers, but also as a, as a turnkey provider, that, that could potentially mean helping to support capacities in one region, I suppose, which, which may be lacking. So how, how are you seeing that the shift in balance in the tier, in the tier suppliers? Well, from a manufacturing standpoint for us, um, and understand we have 12 manufacturing facilities around, around the world, and most of them are very specific to what, what we produce. Um, we were never one that offshored a lot of, of, uh, of the machine production, with the exception of the downturn after the 1980s, where most uh, British and and American machine tool companies went to Taiwan, mm -hmm. okay? But we started five years ago reshoring, reshoring all of that. So our, our reshoring efforts are, are ongoing. And, and right now, for instance, because of so many of the supply chain issues that we've had in, um, in North America, let's say, uh, we haven't had the, the same level of problems in our, in our Asian plants, but in North America. So we're now actually onshoring more production to our German and our Swiss facilities here. Um, the, other, the other initiative that we've been very active in is uh, looking at our, our various operations of those 12, those 12 factories. And, you know, the machine tool industry has been one that um, traditionally changes to outsourcing <laughs> on, a, on a whim. You know, it's like, uh, they'll, they'll start uh, thinking we can cut costs this way by, by doing that. So we have been gradually, really over the last five years, uh, but really sped that up here in the last two years of, of insourcing. In other words, um, we, 
of what we can. You know, we're, we'll get into the whole mm -hmm. chip problem as, as a, how it affects, you know, the tier ones as well as how it have, has been affecting, affecting us. And those are things that we can't, you know, we can't be vertically integrated mm -hmm. with regards to our manufacturing. But a very, very concerted effort of being self-sufficient at each one of those 12 manufacturing facilities, which then in turn led us to um, having to go back to regionalizing our supply chain. You know, I've been, as you said, 35 years in manufacturing, and it wasn't until this past year that I even heard, you know, heard the word deglobalization. Mm. For 35 years of my career, it's all been about globalization. Mm. And how do you how do you globalize your your supply chain? And here we are now trying to figure out how to deglobalize. Maybe it is time for me to retire. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, we didn't mention that you started at six years old, I think, at plant <laughs> as well. So let's give a credit on 35 years. But um, well, I am 61. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to jump a bit more into 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 this topic from the point of view of electrification. Or no, you, you mentioned the five new plants, OK, two in China, three in Mexico and then in Europe, uh, converting more, 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 more factories and component plants you know, to be fit for, for the new age. Can you just give us a sense of the roadmap there, for that? Give us a, a sense of, of what that looks like in terms of the key, key transition points as well, what, yeah. what plants are gonna be turned into? Yeah. Um, we roughly employ 23,000 people in all our um, 26 plants and um, a big chunk of that is in, in Europe, yeah, Germany. And uh, what we developed over the course of the last year and a half was a clear um, target picture pretty much for every plant. Yeah. Um, and that, of course, obviously is a living document, a living exercise, because, I mean, you see the immobility e picking up at a, at a um, huge pace. Yeah. And uh, the product strategy plans of the OEMs change. That's what Steve mentioned earlier, yeah, that the, the combustion engine plants are based on the bands, which are decided now in 35, but also to customer behavior, which is, which is changing. Um, these, these influences um, change as, as, at a drastic pace, and we need to realign and readjust our roadmaps for, for these individual plants. Um, most of them are um, still necessary yeah, because you need to have the production capacity and the skills also which I mentioned earlier we have plants which are very skilled in, in systems assembly we have plants which are um, very skilled in component manufacturing those probably will be um, suitable to produce an electric motor for example yeah. and then we have a network of electronics plants this network is rather small here it's less about transformation, it's more about building up the capacity mm. which we need. Yeah? But uh, we have an, an, a, a specialized area in the operations overhead which deals with these uh, target pictures and with the footprint strategy. It's a, a small team of a couple of people and they do that constantly. Yeah? They rework constantly. And, and you alluded to it earlier, but that you're implying that actually most of those plants can be converted. In other words, uh, it's not necessarily a case must of total be, must be, They must be must converted. Be. Okay, and because what are some need, of the key things? You need things the skill, you need? yeah? You, yeah. Need the skills. you need the skilled people. You cannot just close plants down and, and ramp new plants up. You need the skilled workforce and, and use that. Yeah? That's the background of it. That's a basic idea. So the skill base uh, and then the, the tooling, equipment, machinery, this, this is what's key. Exactly. Yeah. And more focus, as I take it, on, on electronics and areas of building yeah. up capacity. And, uh, so then hearing some of that, Stephen, I mean, just again, for a company like yours, how do you then uh, adapt to, 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 to fit this changing footprint as well? Well, you know, I, I would say adapting is going to be how we operate in, this, in the same way. So, um, as, as I mentioned, we have 12, 12 manufacturing plants, and what we're constantly looking for is the best location for our, for our manufacturing, but also then the consolidation. So to give you an example, uh, and again, I mentioned we're a, an American company with European technology. That's, that was the strategy that we took um, really 30, 30 years ago. 
Um, and one of the areas that we, we focused on was uh, super precision grinding. We, we've acquired six European, all European brands, mainly, mainly Swiss. Um, and you know, and each one of these were small operations, small small plants. So, um, you know, three years ago, we decided that we we're going to consolidate a lot of our manufacturing in um, in Switzerland. Um, and so, we're now under construction with a 33,000 square foot um, facility. That's um, that you know we're. Typical American, right? <laughs> why, why re-outfit three factories when we can build one new one uh, that, that's far more efficient? <laughs> ah, sorry. Uh, so, but but again, the, you know, uh, maybe jumping ahead a little bit, the reasons for that is, you know, we're we'll we'll gain a twenty percent in productivity, and we're going to cut our our operating costs from an energy standpoint um, by eighty percent. Mm. Yeah. So, so again, it's it's the the same types of uh, types of uh, manufacturing, let's say that we do, um, that that most of our customers do as well. And so we're constantly looking for better ways of manufacturing and more efficient ways of manufacturing. It's interesting, Arnold, because then obviously we, we've heard that the, the strategy in Europe is then not to go greenfield at, at the moment, uh, is 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 to convert. So. So what, what are you depending on to help uh, in the operations to ensure that those operations are as efficient, digitalized, automated, et cetera, to stay competitive? Is, is, this, is this a challenge in working in the existing facilities? Um, yeah, obviously we're looking into best in class. I mean, you know um, that going into the EV market, uh, that's quite a cost sensitive um, topic because uh, obviously that's no, no secret. We are facing a tough competition and we have peers which are, which are not sleeping also. <laughs> and um, so we need best in class manufacturing and um, we uh, developed um, something like a blueprint for, for the new factories we build up. Yeah, um, as I said, we're building up five plants as we speak. Um, even one in Europe, yeah, I did not mention that earlier, in, in Serbia, big uh, operations. And um, here, I mean, when, when you install a new plant, you want to do it right. Yeah? You want to use most and best in class digitalization, best value stream, optimum logistics to, to reduce the inventory situation and all those things. Uh, high automation level um, to be cost competitive. And th this we all cast into something like a, a playbook yeah, for these new plans. And we try to do copy and, and paste per product uh, where it is possible. And um, the idea for the existing plans is uh, to manage this transformation with kind of like a retrofit. Retrofit, retrofit yeah. yeah of, of these digitalization tools. Yeah, we have... Um, uh, um, a huge number of use cases uh, which we have individually in, in the plans and we are putting them together and, and then cast, cast it like a, a blueprint for, for, the, for the new plans and, and take that also to, to manage the old, older plans. <clears throat> and if we turn a bit deeper into the digitalization side actually, so because um, I'm interested to, to understand a little bit more what some of that retrofit might, might look like. I mean, where have you made the most progress in, in let's say, the c making more connected smart factories within that? Yeah. Um, I mean, what is digitalization? Everybody talks about that, but uh, to kind of like make that a little bit more um, touchable. Mm. It is really acquiring data from your products and from your processes. Um, store this data in, in, in a data lake, a, a huge database or something like this and then make use of, of this data yeah, as best as you can to improve A, the product and B, the process, stabilize the process and, and um, Im improve also um, the efficiency. That's the idea. Yeah? Now for this you need connectivity. You need, to you need to connect the machines, you need to connect all the plants to a cloud. Yeah? And uh, then um, look at the digital tools which you have, sometimes individually, sometimes in the cloud, sometimes from, from other peers even. Yeah? 
Um, here, open source program will, programming will come into play. Mm. Yeah, that's a hot topic in nowadays. And uh, yeah, that's what we what we are connecting right now. We, we have um, um, a cloud-based solution for all our plants, and and they all going to be connected soon. We are in the middle right now, as far as the number of plants connected. And then we take the individual tools which are um, in the plants and roll them out to the the the, the other ones where they are, uh, where these use cases are not connected yet. Yeah, that's uh, the the exercise behind that. Is it helping or will help you to roll out small services, predictive maintenance, common apps and things like that across the plants? Yeah, predictive maintenance is one of the hot topics, but there's also other things. OE data analysis is, is one thing. Um, then um, um, a digital twin to see really what, what is the inventory level, what's the material flow online real, real time, yeah? where is your material in, in the plant. Um, and a lot of other uh, use has logistics a hot topic um, to connect the uh, log logistics center and um, automated transport of the goods out of the logistics center to manufacturing and back. All those things uh, will be in the smart factory and we have very detailed plans and, and uh, ideas uh, how, to, how to fill that out and it, that will be first realized in this blueprint plans mm -hmm. which I mentioned earlier. Yeah, but that's a that's a super important topic because, um, as I said earlier, um, for the for the EBD drive trains, we really need to be best in class. Yeah? And without digitalization in the future, that's totally impossible. Yeah? Impossible to, to, to meet the, the competitive levels, uh, scale levels. Of Competitivity and, and quality, um, inventory situation. Yeah? I mean, you, you, you talked about earlier, a disruptive supply chain, so you want to have the right stuff in your in your plants, obviously, yeah. and data for all those things is key. Yeah? And and digitalization gives us the possibility that's that's new coming up over the course of the last three five years to have real time data and and make use of it manually yeah, with mm -hmm. people who analyze the data, optimized with with. Uh, artificial intelligence. We have quite a number of artificial intelligence um, use cases already here and there, yeah. Uh, but but that has to be rolled out. Yeah, that's uh, the key. Mm. Stephen, I want to maybe turn to you on on, on that. Uh, on the one hand, you have machines which maybe should be connected for your for your customers. Um, but then I also learned from you, I think yesterday or, or, or Friday, uh, that you bought a software company too. So maybe you can give us some, some sense of how this is uh, uh, changing at you. For yeah, the other, well. other part of my job, the M&A side. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, again, um, from, the, from a structural standpoint, we, we face the challenges to deliver machines to our customers that are connected and that are delivering the, the data. As, as Arno and I had spoken a couple of days ago, you know, the, we, we can give him any, you know, any data that he needs. It's making use of the data. I think I've heard that said multiple times here yet, yet today. Um, but we're also you know, being re requested that we, we manage the data. Again, as, as the manufacturing industry has turned to the machine tool industry to do more and more with regards to automation, with regards to uh, measuring, with regards to turnkey, turnkey solutions, managing the data is also. So tr trying to you know, take 12 manufacturing facilities that all have electrical engineers in, in these plants and standardize uh, on software for the CNC machine tool industry was tough, which is why then we, we decided last year just to invest in a software company that does just that. It's focused strictly on the machine tool industry and, and, and we then bring them in to our customers as well as you know, the, the manufacturing industry in general as a, as a way of solving this this uh, this solution uh, excuse me solving this problem that the industry is looking for a solution yeah and and this was um, perhaps later on we can also make sure to connect you with some of our speakers from the morning because this was a key topic um, with Rudiger from Audi 
just building a digital culture and, and mindset to be able to look across all operations and, and obviously then uh, make better decisions on that. Um, what are steps that ZF is taking either within the operations or perhaps together with your digital teams to, to learn how to make, you know, put the data to good use as opposed to just collecting it? So what are the key, key steps? Lots of steps. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of things are necessary. Uh, you do. I mean, as a as a tier one uh, automotive uh, company, you, you need to build up the competencies. Yeah, you need to have competencies to to manage digitalization of your operations area in the plants at the machines. You need it then on a higher level because you need to as Steve said, make use of the data. Then even one, one level beyond on corporate level, you need a centralized uh, digitalization unit yeah, to um, transfer this knowledge to other areas of, of the overall corporate. Uh, and um, this is what, we, what we're looking at right now. Yeah? We have target uh, plans, target views, uh, what we need where. In the plants, uh, and and here we are um, fulfilling that um, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I would say three quarter of the way already. Yeah, uh, but you need to have you need to have a lot of, uh, and that's probably diff different from the years before. Really, you need to have the the competencies. The, the I would say hackers, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really at the machine. Yeah, because you cannot steer. You cannot steer that from from a centralized uh, corporate level. Yeah, and you need you need to have uh, um, decentralized digitalization competencies. Let's say Python Python programmers or um, Power BI users and all those things really on the shop floor. Mm -hmm because they need to be connected to the specialists, to, to the process specialists, yeah? The people who know the problem, yeah? Because, I mean, sometimes in the last years you had a digitalization, a, a digital tool and did not have the problem for this, yeah? <laughs> That's what, what Steve always says, yeah? Really, really making use of the data in that way that it improves your process and solves your problem. Mm. And so you have, you have to bring the people who know the problem and the people who, who are able to cast that into a digital tool together. Yeah, and it does not make sense to have digital digitalized um, unicorns somewhere in your ivory tower um, in, 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 in corporate and, and try to solve problems which are not there. Yeah? So that's the key, my point of view. So we need to recruit hackers and data scientists <laughs> to, to be on the shop floor. <laughs> You heard it here first. Uh, <laughs> can I, uh, any, any questions or, or comments from the audience? Uh, whilst we have our experts on the panel here, any point, please just, just put your hand up and we'll, we'll get a microphone um, over to you. Um, it, it, maybe another point on, on the data before we move to other, other topics. Um, uh, you know, to what extent is, is, the, is a lack of standards uh, an, an issue or is that something that you have now more under control? And then a follow on to that would be if you're working as part of wider groups like Container X, for example, to, uh, which has also come up in other sessions, to, to uh, standardize this more at an industry level um, or no? Yeah. Uh, yes and no, it is a problem. Yeah, or well, it can be, it can be a yeah. problem. It was more in the past yeah, in the past, I mean, the equipment manufacturers in the past were not aligned, aligned on data models to, to acquire the data out of the machine. Uh, but we saw here recently um, quite good steps in towards standardized data models. And on one side and on the other side, uh, the program languages and the, we call that advanced analytics um, tools and, and uh, um, softwares you get for that, they are able to handle also data which is not into one data model. So they're much more versatile. Mm. Yeah, That changed rapidly over the course of the last couple of years. And uh, even it was for me an eye opener that uh, out of a sudden this uh, diversified uh, landscape you had before, yeah, it's not not such a big kind of problem anymore, mm. yeah. Because of the tools which are handling the the stuff, the data coming out of these processes, 
are more powerful, getting more powerful. Yeah? Mm. Well, I wanted to, to, to turn, so we, we've covered aspects of the disruption in the supply chain, we've touched upon electrification, transformation, digitalization. Uh, if we turn to, let's turn to the to the energy crisis first here in, in, in Europe, um, uh, Arno, can, can you give us a sense, firstly, in your plants and operations, uh, what measures or are there measures and impacts that you're, that you're feeling or expecting to feel as we, as we go into winter? Is it already impacting decisions that you're making in the operation? On energy, you ask? Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. I did not understand that. Um, I mean, first of all, who lives in Germany um, nowadays sees uh, that it might probably not be as as harsh as we thought. Yeah, uh, we were heading into the winter time um, to um, making a couple of investments to be less dependent. Uh, we reduced the gas usage. I mean, we have that in the casting plants, obviously, but also in 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 other areas, both for processes and for heating. We made investments to reduce that roughly, but let's say by a level of twenty percent. Yeah, that costs us a couple of million euros uh, to, to invest that. Um, this is all in place now and it's working. Yeah, so we, we cut the gas usage um, there. Um, moreover this, um, we saw that also as a, as a driver to um, go more into energy reduction. Yeah? So in my point of view, um, avoidance is, is more the key um, rather than um, really, really shifting the process, let's say, to electric heating or even to oil or such things. Yeah, we had to consider that also. Did not opt for this, but it was in discussion. Um, but uh, right now, um, I think we are in, in a good situation, uh, at least as it, as it looks uh, for the moment. It's again more a bit more positive than than we might have thought, as you said not long ago. If we tie that then to your your, your wider sustainability targets in operations and and, and manufacturing, uh, firstly, tell us a little more about what those targets are, are you know when it comes down to the plant and and what your progress are in in, in reaching them. Yeah, I mean first of all you have to have to <coughs> you have to speak a little bit more about where do the sustainability targets come from? Yeah. It's not. It's not really. They come not out of this energy situation which we have. It, it comes more from the overall situation which we have on the planet. Yeah, and I'm being a, a citizen here. I, I really I see that very positive because you see that it's absolutely necessary to deal with this topic, and um, our customers. Um, and and when you quote a product nowadays to to a customer they really see that as a given thing, yeah? that you have a clear sustainability roadmap for your manufacturing plants. Yeah? For, for corporate, we have a target to be neutral um, around 2040 yeah? and deducted from that a target to be 80% um, reduced as to a baseline 2019, we say in this case, by 2030. Yeah? And there's a lot of green power available, um, at least in Europe nowadays. Um, and um, as such, we have um, for a couple of plants um, very, very closely, also in already in, in 23, 24, we have achieved or we will achieve climate neutrality already. Yeah? And when we build up a new plant, I talked about that earlier, um, a clear um, request and we really talk to the talk directly to the government yeah and, and not always only to the local government also to higher um, units there we clearly request that yeah that has major effect on on the footprint decisions yeah where we build up a plant is green power available or not yeah and so it all flows together no? from, from the customer the requirements from our overall targets into the footprint um, and, and we have a cl very clear picture um, also per plant and, and per, per unit when we will achieve what and uh, how we fulfill our internal um, targets. So, that, so it's, it's really becoming um, a given, given thing and, and uh, really important, yeah? mm. much more important than let's say five years ago. Yeah? And as you say, it's, it's, it's in, in, in the end there, obviously governments have a role to play, but you feel it's ultimately the customer driving this more than, okay, the Russia-Ukraine crisis we know is an issue, but at the end of the day, the customer, obviously there's regulations that are coming into here too, 
Um, but I, I think that's a positive side. And, and so, Harding, um, Stephen, just again coming to, to Hardinger and that, how do you, how are you adapting for sustainability targets? Well, of, of course, we're focused much more on our European operations um, because of government regulations. Yeah. Um, but, but I'd like to return to that uh, new plant that we're, we're building, and you know, we're investing $110 million in, in that new facility, and obviously the, the ROI is through the productivity. But n not to belittle the Americans that we just build bigger plants for uh, higher production, we put into this plant geothermal chilling uh, and, and solar um, uh, voltaic uh, to be able to be uh, as close to 100% self-sufficient as, as we can. Right out of the gate next year when we get started, we'll be 75% uh, self-sufficient in, in all of our utilities in, in that facility. Uh, again, it's not a... You know, you're not going to get a return on 110 million Swiss francs and uh, you know overnight just on the energy savings. But but we will see. Like I said, we'll cut our our uh, our, our costs. But we look at it. This is this is a company that we've owned um, that's that's uh, 95 years old. We plan to own it for another 95 at least. So again, from a sustainability standpoint, we do look long term mm -hmm. at, uh, at at all of our, our our manufacturing facilities in the in the same way. We don't have to belittle the Americans there at all. Susan, <laughs> I think you know this would, would never be our aim. No, but I think that's a that, that that's an important point in long term view. Um, I think we're, we're we're just down to a few minutes left in this session, but and I want to kind of close talking about something we've spoken about before, um, Arno, with the sort of war for talent, um, you know, and the, and the challenges and how there might be specific in the tier one or in, in the supplier side. Um, you know, do you, do you shift, do you see, for example, the, the, what we talked about earlier, the you know, change towards more electronics and, and, and the shift in the profile of the, of the plants. Is the warfare talent playing a, a, a challenge here? Is it, is it, might it change or help by this transformation? How, how, do, you, how do you see that developing now? War for talent is a tough phrase, I would say, yeah. <laughs> I think it's more, uh, I mean, getting the right people yeah, for the job and, and also retaining your people is important. Yeah? Um, not necessarily only for electronics. Electronics is a huge thing for us because it's somewhat new to the industry and, and for a couple of players. So here, obviously, you have to have um, really, let's say, um, the right workforce, and that's not at least let's say not not in the amount you would need it. If you if you build up like me, three four electronic plants, um, it's difficult in these areas where they're built up to find so many electronic specialists. Yeah? Obviously, that's that's given. Yeah? Um, but um, on top of that, in, in in general, I think you have to take care of of your people, and you have to take care of the development of your workforce. Mm. Yeah not only for electronics, also for other things. There's a lot of other processes which are new for the electric motors, for example, hairpin technology, the, the material, a lot of copper is involved, copper cutting and, and copper uh, bending and all those things. Uh, there's a lot of new processes involved. And um, here, as we said earlier, uh, we have uh, manufacturing plants which we want to convert or need to convert. Yeah. And um, we take that very serious. Um, we came up with um, a couple of um, methods to, to bring these new technologies and this new knowledge to our people. First of all, digital. I mean, we have come up with, um, we call that e-academy. That is a digital um, uh, platform where everybody in his work time from, from the shop floor up to the management level can go in and, and look at lessons and, and learn about the product, the regulations, the manufacturing process and everything, yeah, which, is, which is connected to that. Um, then we do, um, we did last year a lot of roadshows to bring the new product um, to the plants, even bring the cars to make it uh, feelable. And in the um, areas um, where um, the edu education, which comes from the government, schools and that, such things, are not so um, up to our needs, like in Mexico, for example, yeah, 
we come up with own solutions um, to build up um, education centers at our plants. Yeah? Mexico plants uh, have their own education center to, uh, and, and that takes quite a number of years. I think three they are in there. Yeah? So that's a, a modular um, approach. And uh, that, that retains your people, yeah? that brings loyalty and brings you a good workforce. So we take several channel, channel, channels to, to solve this issue. Excellent examples there. And uh, Stephen, just the final thoughts on that too, how you're developing, recruiting, retaining your talent in this transition. Yeah, um, we've had about 1,800 employees worldwide. Half of those are in, in Europe. And um, it is challenging in, in Europe, but it's, it's also um, where we, we, we focus on, as, a, as an American company that has most of its operations in Europe, we re realize that you know, we're, and, and the fact that we're producing 60, close to 70% of all of our products are manufactured in Europe is why we, we, we focus on, on that retention. So, um, and, and we also have much better apprenticeship programs in our European operations than we do anywhere else in, in the world. So we, we spend a lot of time and money on that. Um, as, as well as uh, diversification, okay? You know, one of the things that has been a uh, challenge to, uh, to, to do in this, you know, the machine tool industry is old, 150-year-old uh, industry, um, getting diversification and, and females in the workforce, uh, especially in the production areas, has, has been challenging. Ten years ago, we started, we started working on that. And so in Germany today, we have 18% um, uh, of our workforce, production workforce, mm. in, uh, in, uh, as, as females. And we have a minimum of 10% of our incoming interns uh, as females at every one of our f facilities here in Europe. Again, a good note for, for future, and this, this is, of course, a, a topic we I would love to talk more about with more time. I know I'm sure it's important as well at ZF2, diversifying the workforce uh, at all levels. Uh, but I think we'll have to leave the discussion there because we're going to move on to other sessions. But I think this is, again, a great look into some of the real issues facing Tier 1 transformation and some fantastic examples. So thank you very much to Arno from ZF and, and Stephen from, from Hardegard.